All right. Welcome, everybody that can join me. If you are watching this recording later, I appreciate uh, you tuning in after the fact. I know a lot of folks uh, that watch after the fact, so definitely uh, appreciate that. Just want to make sure we are recording. Yes, we are recording. All right. Welcome to the On Scene First Nina ENP study group for the fall 2022 test period. I'm really excited that we have just passed uh, the summer testing period in uh, July. And I've received lots of, of celebratory messages that folks have preliminary passed. Uh, and there's no better time of the year for me when, when I do the study groups and then start hearing back from folks. So if you're getting ready to take the exam right now and you're just throwing in, because I, I think there's a little time left for the summer testing period, I always throw, out, throw this out there. Um, please, hold on a second. My dog is wanting out. Hold on one second. Oh, shenanigans, the problem with working from home. Uh, so yeah, so testing period is going on now. If you, or when you take the exam, what I always encourage folks to do is, you know, if, if you don't want to tell me that you preliminary passed or failed because you don't want to kind of mess up any mojo, um, if you can at least just, yeah, benefits. Um, if If you can at least just... One of the things that I look for that helps me make the next testing period better is when folks reach out to let me know that they took the test and then they let me know topics that uh, maybe they didn't hear about in the study group or because with each one of them, the study groups are getting better and, and better um, because folks are reaching back and sharing, you know, things. Just this recent one. I had two people reach out and tell me that there was 988 stuff. There were there were two questions that they recall. They don't know the exact questions, but there were two questions on the 988 stuff. So I reached out to Nina. I said, hey, look, I don't see anything in the study guide and, you know, point me in the right direction. So there is something in the study guide that I will be putting together that has been added into the 6.1 version, uh, as well as an article that was in the Nina, the call, the magazine that April Heinze did. Uh, so I was pointed in the right direction where to get the information for those particular things. So that will be added into this study group. Uh, but I wouldn't have known that unless somebody reached back and said, hey, there were two questions on, on 988. So you should probably go through that. So we really appreciate you coming back and, and just letting me know, hey, I don't know what the halo effect is. That was in the first study group. I had no idea what the halo effect was, but it was one sentence in the book. So with each study session, it gets it just gets better and better for sure. So just a couple of housekeeping things that I have to go over every session because folks just randomly find my videos on YouTube and I want to make sure that they get the best bang for their free bucks, right? Free 99. So this is the study group that is tentatively tentatively for the fall 2022 EMP exam. However, a lot of folks will be using this for the winter exam as well. Uh, the one that's going to be right after 2020, uh, the early 2023. So if you find this video between July 1st, 22nd, uh, 2022 and September 30th, 
and you want to join the actual study group and get the materials, I give out um, the study. Uh, I, I give out some study documents. I give you the PDFs each session. I give you an MP3 version of this study group. I pull the audio and, and put it there for folks that like to listen on their way to work. I, some people fall asleep listening to it. Osmosis, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I will give you access to all of those things. You just have to register at the website that you see there on scenefirst.com slash training slash study ENP. If you're finding this after September 30th and you want to be added to the Google group where all of those materials are contained, then just shoot me an email, tldridge at onscenefirst.com, and I'll be happy to add you to the, to the previous group. That's after September 30th. The next live study group will be in January of 2023. Now, with that said, stuff happens. You don't get to take the exam this October and you decide you want to join the next study group because remember what I said each study group gets better and better because I get more and more feedback and I make sure that they get covered and that's why the time is a little bit longer this time as well as I added a couple of weeks for a buffer so if stuff comes up like it did last week so if you want to be notified of all of the shenanigans that Tracy is up to make sure you go to my website scroll down to the bottom of the page and register for my newsletter. I tend to, when I'm doing um, any type of free training or offerings, I will make sure that they go out in, in a newsletter. So make sure that your system can receive on scene first stuff and we'll go from there. With that said, uh, that little bit of a buffer, I'm glad that I built that in there. I know that last week I was um, not available to, to do the session and I was going to send out a recording. My mom was scheduled to have heart surgery on Friday, and at the last minute, they canceled because of another issue they found. The issue has been signed off on, and she won't be able to have the surgery until the end of August, which is super stressful because uh, it's a lot of work on the rest of the family to help take care of her until that happens. So I appreciate your patience and understanding, uh, but don't worry, you will be getting all of the materials I just didn't have the bandwidth to get a recording done this week. And I know you all understand. I want to say thank you to my premier study group for the ENP, uh, my premier sponsor for the ENP study group, Rapid SOS. Uh, they have generously donated to this cause, and it in turn allows for us to have uh, ENP exam scholarships for folks that cannot. <laughs> I have a grand dog baby here too. So um, so the premier study group is um, premier sponsor for the study group is Rapid SOS and I'm super appreciative for what they do for me. NGA Next Generation Advanced is the premier study, uh, gosh, I can't even talk today, is the premier sponsor for the On Scene First podcast and media stuff. So anything that you see that I do, we just did two webinars last week, uh, one with Hank Hunt and Mark Fletcher at the beginning of the week, and one with um, Jim Marshall on the Wellness Standard. If you haven't seen those webinars, if you're looking for the information, just go to my website under training and the web uh, the webinars are there on demand. So you can just click there and watch those webinars. So lots of good training there. We currently have seven scholarships out of over 500 registered folks for this particular exam coming up for this study group. There's uh, just right around 500 folks registered. We have 43 applicants for the scholarship. So if your agency does not cover the exam fee and you want to submit for that scholarship, here is where you can do that. You have to be part of the study group. So if you're watching this after the fact or you're not part of the the actual study group by registration, um, please go and register and you have to have that application in by August 5th. So there's that. And these are the folks that make those scholarships possible. And if there's anybody that is on the commercial side that is in this study group that wants to contribute, please reach out to me as soon as possible. We would love for you to be able to, to sponsor one of the exams, if not two. Um, 
because a lot of folks are putting the bill on their own. And I know that it is really appreciated. All right. So if you have any questions, don't hen hesitate to put them in the, the chat. I, I do watch that while we're, we're teaching. So if you have anything valuable to add, please do so. So this section is types and features of the 91 systems. One of the things that I like to explain in my study groups is I will give you all of the information that is in the body of knowledge. I will also add valuable information that I think is important for you to know. And I will tell you when I add those things. So if, and there is a couple of those things in this particular, uh, this week's session. So I, for the most part, if I'm just talking, it's either in the body of knowledge, that outline that you get, or it's in the 6.1 study manual, or it is in a reference document that is in the 6.1 study manual. Uh, because there's a lot of folks that don't realize that as you're going through that 6.1 study manual, you will see that it makes reference to a document. And Nina has said before that not everything is in the study manual. It might be found in one of those reference manuals so or the reference document. So whenever I reference a document, I always put it in the slide and then I will also put it in the follow-up email with a hyperlink so you can just get to it uh, very quickly. So today we are going to go over the features. And if you've taken the session before, or you've heard me speak about Annie and Allie, I always go back to how I learned about it as a baby dispatcher. And my instructor, Mona Wallace, always called it Big Al and Little Annie. So Big Al is all the information. So in this image, all the information that you see here, Big Al is the caller's phone number, the address, any supplemental information that's available, anything that was available at the time of the call. And little Annie is just the phone number, just the phone number. And I know there's some folks on here that are, you know, just starting out in their career and maybe they've been in for three years and they have the criteria to, to take the exam. But sometimes you'd be surprised at what folks don't fully understand as far as even just the basics of, of the 9-1 system and the process, they might call it something different, the call record or, or something. So definitely need to know the acronyms, uh, automated number information and automated location information. Automatic, sorry, not automated. So we're going to talk about basic 9-1. I feel like sometimes... Um, if Allie provides the number, why we have in. So because the Annie, just the phone number, that's a great question, Hank. Um, because the Annie, the phone number, it, it's just the place that it is on the Alley screen. So when you look at it, a whole Alley screen, you're going to see the phone number there. It's not in a different place. So if somebody is making reference to the phone number, and the behaviors or the, the processes that the Annie uses. So the Annie will translate into something else, which we'll talk about in a couple of the other sessions too. Um, the Annie is what drives the other information attached to it that directs the call where to go and where they're supposed to go. So that 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 is a great question. Annie is just, they're, they're two separate things, but the Annie is just displayed on the alley screen. Um, so you can find everything in one place. And on some systems, the Annie is uh, in a different place also under a tab that, that is titled Annie. So the basic 911 system, um, I know sometimes it seems weird that we're going so far back to the what what feels like forever ago, you know, just over 50, uh, 52 years or so ago. Um, but the exam, you, you kind of need to know the evolution of the 911 system. So first, basic 911. There's some things that I learned uh, when I first started doing the study group that I was like, oh, I didn't I didn't really know that. But, but I'm glad that I do now because it helps things make sense. So the basic 911 is an emergency telephone system which automatically connects 911 callers to a designated answering point. The first 911 call was placed in Haleyville, Alabama 
on February 16th, 1968. 16th? Yes. 18th? Oh my God. I'm, I'm, I'm having a brain, like my brain is fried right now. Uh, I just, I just lost my mind for a moment. Uh, but you know, just over 50 years ago, it is the 16th. Yes. I know. I know Hank, you would definitely know that. And, uh, it's, I, I, I don't know why I just had a, a moment. Um, but in basic 911, the call routing was determined by the originating central office. And we talked about the central office last, last, uh, two weeks ago, um, and the basic 911, it may or it may not support uh, Annie or Alley. So it's going to depend on the system. I don't know of any agencies today that are currently working off of a basic 911 system, uh, but there were agencies that when I started as a baby dispatcher, they were, um, they were definitely, um, there were definitely a lot of agencies that were still working off of, yeah, no Annie even, right? It's like you just picked up a red phone. And that's why on that previous screen, I had um, this red phone here because I know when I first started working in my town, they, they had a, a red phone that was still there. Actually, I have one sitting on the wall right there that they mounted as a, as a thank you for my service. Uh, but the, the, there was nothing really attached to it. So you, you just, you called, you picked up the phone, you dialed 911. In some agencies, they would just, the call would go to a red phone and then five people in the town would pick up a red phone and then they would, one person would talk and the rest would listen. And then they'd notify people by a phone tree to respond to calls. It's it's crazy to see where we are now, right? But as far as what we need to know for our exam is basic 911, an emergency telephone system that, oh, I already said that, duh. Um, in conjunction, we're going to talk about camera trunks next week. But you'll notice that whenever I have to make reference to an acronym, I will identify what the acronym is. And then I'm going to tell you whether or not we're going to learn about it later. Um, and camera trunks are just a certain type of, of, of networking ways for for calls to get to the public safety answering point that we will peel back the layers on that a little bit later. But the first major advancement to basic 911 was camera trunks. And camera trunks were first used for long distance dialing. Um, that's why they were created, okay? They allow the phone number to be delivered to the PSAP. So that's that we're adding on, right? So this is basic on steroids, basic that actually had Annie and Allie, which this is what, when I said that I didn't, I learned something, I learned that there was that basic uh, 911 can have Annie and Allie. So that could throw you off if there's, there's an exam question there, right? So just know that there are certain systems that did have the ability, uh, they were basic, uh, but they may have had Annie Allie information. Um, Via equipment at the center, the phone number was wrapped in a data message and sends its query to the Alley database. So it's the it's the makings of Enhanced 911. It's starting the process of, of Enhanced 911, but it's not Enhanced 911. So there's a difference. There's It's basic, then basic with, with just Annie Alley, and then you're going to see where the difference is. There's going to be a major difference with that Enhanced 911. So enhanced 911 is the telephone system which includes network switching, okay? So there's a couple of components and I know there's one specific thing that's got that I've heard of and seen on the exam myself, um, but the enhanced 911 and if you've been in the space about 20-ish years or so, uh, Enhanced 911 was, was kind of starting to make its waves there. There's a lot of agencies that had it long before 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, so there's network switching, databases, public safety answering point premise elements that are capable of providing the automatic location information, that alley information, selective routing, meaning the call is going to go here and then it's going to selectively route to the right 911 center, selective transfer, 
fixed transfer and a callback number. Now we're going to go through selective routing, fixed transfer, and um, callback numbers later in it, some of them in today's session and then some in another session. So selective routing is the big deal with Enhanced 91. I'm going to say it now and then I'm going to say it again. If they ask you the question is, what is the big deal? What is the big thing that happened when Enhanced 911 was put into place? It's the biggest thing is, is the selective routing, which we're starting to move away from with, with next generation 911. When full next generation 911 is deployed, selective routers go away. Um, so selective routing is the differentiator between basic and enhanced. Selective routing, again, we're going to go a little bit deeper, but I don't like to talk about something without giving a little bit of a understanding of what it is. It's when the 911 calls are routed based on the street address of the 911 caller. So when you have a landline call, that selective router, 911 call gets placed, it goes to the selective router, selective router says, oh, this needs to go to this particular public safety answering point. The selective router cannot understand the address. So when, when that call gets placed, so if I was to pick up my landline right now and I picked up the phone to dial 911, the selective router can't understand that my address is, you know, 123 Acme Street. So what it does is it has to turn the address in the system. The address gets turned into something called an ESN, an emergency service number, based on the address that is put into the MSAG, the Master Street Address Guide. So as soon as that address hits the MSAG, it now turns it into an ESN and it says, all right, it needs all the, all the calls that have this particular ESN need to go to this PSAP. And we're going to talk more about ESN numbers later. And then there will also be a selective transfer, fixed transfer, and alternate routing in Enhance 911. And we'll talk more about each one of those. Generally speaking, Enhance 911 has three components that basic 911 does not have. So if it says, what are the three components of Enhanced 911? This is what they are. Selective Routing Database, SRDB. And if you go into the Google group and you go a couple of, uh, at any time you are in one of the emails, you will be able to select the link to the drive, to the Google Drive. When you go into that Google Drive, there are a few different folders. There's the MP3 folder, there is the PDF folder, and I think that's it right now, um, but PDFs and other documents. Check out the stuff that's in there. I put an acronym chart in there. There are acronyms on the exam. Somebody told me recently that they were told that there are no acronyms on the exam. I don't know where that information came from, but I can assure you that every person I've asked, there are still acronyms on the exam. So it is important to know what the acronyms are. You may be able to find them somewhere in the text of the exam, but I would highly recommend knowing what your acronyms are and what the, the thing does. Um, so the SRDB is the Selective Router Database an MSAG master street address guide and the ability to translate an ESN number. So the ability to translate that address into an ESN number and deliver it to the, um, the appropriate PSAP. I'm gonna say it again, Enhanced 911 added the ability to selectively route based on location. It provides a callback number and the caller location. So those are the three things that we're looking for. Next generation 911, we are not going to go too far into it right here. This is basically what I want you to know for this particular section because it falls under the, the types and features of 911 systems. But we're going to have a whole section on NG911 in um, a couple of weeks. 
But just as a basic knowledge, we've been hearing this term since early 2000. We're like 22 years into next gen 911. It should really be now 911 because so many agencies are are deploying it. We're not fully deployed in you know as many places as we really should be, but next generation 911 is a secure IP based open standard system compromised of hardware, software, data and operational policies and procedures. Computer based interweb the internet superhighway, okay? It, it allows us more features. It allows redundancy. It allows convenience. It's much faster. A lot of folks were very afraid of NG911 because they thought that it just meant pictures and videos. And it's not just pictures and videos. It is speed and redundancy and convenience. If, if a media was to hit Tracy's, <laughs> my redundancy being it, having a backup, right? So the, the redundancy I was just going to mention is if if a meteor hits Tracy's 911 center today, and see, I'm saying that because I don't have a 911 center today, but if a meteor hit my 911 center today and I had to pick up and move, which I'm going to share that with you at the end of today's session, we're going to talk about some PSAPs that were um, had to move out during COVID and they had to go somewhere else. And they were able to use the redundancy of, you know, I could just pick up my center and go somewhere else. And it, it it's it's working in two places. So really important to have that with next generation I one. We are going to talk more about VoIP, voice over internet protocol. In some cases, it's interconnected protocol. I, I heard somebody, uh, it was mentioned interconnected protocol and somebody tried to con correct me, uh, which if I make a mistake, I'm all about being corrected. Uh, but there's there's instant instances where it's uh, internet protocol, and then there's times where it's interconnected. And we'll do more on VoIP later. Uh, but for the type of 91 system, this is what I want you to know now. Um, so enhanced 911 for VoIP, a VoIP service provider, VSP customer must register their address with their VoIP service provider. How many of you on here? I know there's a few of you, okay? I love that, James. The House just passed a bill with uh, Jessica Rosenworcel's Spectrum Rights idea, $10 billion to fund the NG91. Thank good, good, because we need to get this moved forward and a lot of folks can't afford it, right? Um, how many of you remember way back when, you know, 911, when, when VoIP first started coming out, we talked a little bit about it a couple of sessions ago with Vonage and, and things like that, um, where folks would have to go on and register their addresses and, and then they'd move or they'd take their phone with them. That became a problem, especially it was so, Kathy, it was totally a, a disaster when it first came out because more people were utilizing the VoIP phone mechanisms they were, you know, I, and I mentioned this before in a couple of sessions ago, you have somebody who lives in Massachusetts, they're a snowbird, they move down to Florida, they're like, oh, I'm just going to take my phone with me, they're going to plug it into the wall down there, and they're going to call to say their house is on fire, but it's going to go here versus to where they are. So we have come a long way uh, since the original VoIP times, uh, but as far as 9-1 goes, as far as the VoIP goes, they have to have a starting point address. These terminals can be referred to as nomadic. They can be moved from one place to another. Um, Gary, uh, published articles, the local newspaper. Yeah, you know, I always talk about using your internet, using um, social media. Hank, you still don't trust VoIP. I don't blame you. If folks are just setting it up and they're not putting the effort into learning and understanding. So the webinar that, that I just did with, with Hank and Mark, Mark Fletcher, I mentioned one of my service providers. When I moved to a VoIP in the, the police department, I was still skeptical of it. And I was, I made sure that all the systems were in place to, to make sure that folks could dial 911 from them because a lot of folks are not educated in the importance of making sure that things are labeled correctly, right? So 
They're referred to as nomadic. If you see the word nomadic in, in the question that you had, this is enhanced 911 for VoIP. Um, the VSP, the VoIP service provider network, acquires an emergency service query key, which is similar to a wireless emergency service routing key. Now, start learning these, the ESQ and the ESRK. We're going to talk about those later in the functions, but basically it's exactly what it says. It's a key that opens the door, maybe make some changes to the data so it fits appropriately into the next place. And I have some silly little charts and stuff that I'll use um, to do that. And I have a, a subpoena story that, that I will share about the ESRK. And again, I'm super excited when I get emails, somebody passed their test and she said that there was an ESRK question on the exam and that she remembered my subpoena story. So you'll get the tools. I hope to make sure you help to help you pass. And then the BSP network associates the ESRK, uh, ESQK with the call and forwards it to the selective router. So in other words, it does some fancy footwork. It makes it, you know, fit, opens the door, makes it fit through the door, and then it sends it where it's supposed to. So those are the components of um, enhanced VoIP. So now we're going to talk about the features of the 911 systems, the things that we that we should know about. And one of the things that I, I know is I'm going to touch on definitions here. And then some of the topics we go in a little bit deeper in in other areas. So we talked a little bit about selective routing. This this played a huge role in enhanced 911. So the actual selective routing is the process by which 911 calls and messages are routed to the appropriate PSAP or designated destination based on the caller's location information. And it is the key factor in the enhanced 911. The location may be conveyed to the system that performs the selective routing function in the form of ANI or pseudo ANI, P ANI, PANI. I don't care what you call it. It's a fake phone number. It's a band-aid that had to be applied to certain 911 calls, specifically wireless calls. Okay, because wireless, our 911 system was set up to be able to, to transport landline calls. When the inception of wireless calls came in, they were like, oh, wait a minute, we're not ready for this. How do we handle this? So we got to make this call look like an actual landline when in reality it's not. So it, it applies this uh, P. Annie, um, Nope, not yet, Frank. Uh, Hank. <laughs> um, it's funny. But my dad was Frank, and you know where I'm going with that. Um, we are going to talk about Northern 91 today. Uh, but the P. Annie is it's a fake phone number that gets assigned to certain calls to make it look like it is in a wireline call and it and it's able to deliver it through the system. So uh, the pseudo Annie P Annie is a 10 digit number used for the purposes of routing 911 calls to the appropriate PSAP. So the selective router is the mechanism in which is, it sends it to the 911 center, but the P Annie is the way that it gets, it gets in there. It's almost like a password to say, knock, knock, who's there, here's the password. As long as the password is correct, then the selective router is going to allow it to go to where it's supposed to go. Okay, so PNE, the password uh, for the number. Now we're going to talk about alternate and default routing. So alternate routing, the reason why, and, and I'm going to, in full disclosure here, um, I know that I've mentioned on numerous occasions I'm a big advocate about understanding when there's challenges for us is that I have severe ADHD. And sometimes when I read definitions, 
I'm literally reading it and it's saying the same exact thing and I'm really struggling to understand it. And the alternate and default routing did that to me. So the reason why I put this picture here is um, because I'm a visual learner as well. So Marion Police Department was our alternate for our 911 calls. So as I'm reading the definitions between alternate and default, they sounded very similar, but I'm going to make it hopefully easy for you to identify because I know there are questions on the exam uh, regarding alternate and default routing. So here's my way of how I remembered it. And, and if it means you putting who your alternate is in a picture, then, then maybe that'll get you a clear understanding. So alternate routing is the capability of routing 911 calls to a designated alternate location if the 911 trunks are busy or out of service. When we go over default routing in the next page, it is going to sound so similar. Alternate routing may be activated upon request or automatically, if detectable, when the 911 equipment fails or the PSAP itself is disabled. The way to know the difference between these two is Marion was my mutual aid. Okay, so my next jurisdiction, they were my mutual aid for 911 calls. If I needed to call upon them, I could. This is how my brain works. If I needed to call on them, I could. I would call my service provider and say, hey, our calls are keep, keep disconnecting. I don't know what the problem is, uh, but I'm putting in a trouble ticket. And in the meantime, I do not want to accept any of my 911 calls because I don't want, you know, a call to get dropped in the middle of it you know, please send them to Marion, whatever the thing is, right, is I can use my alternate. The thing with the alternate is the alternate, the, the 911 call knows where to go. It knows I have to get to Rochester. But if there's a roadblock, if there's a problem, if, if all circuits are busy now, you know, boo boo dee, all circuits are busy now, the call has to go somewhere. So it's going to go to my alternate, just like in a play. Okay. You have an alternate, the person that, so, so my 911 center is the star of the show, but I have an alternate that's going to step in if, if I actually, in fact, break a leg when somebody, you know, tells me to break a leg at the show, the alternate is the person that's going to step in when you can't perform. So that's that's the alternate. Marion was my alternate. They were my backup. They were gonna step in when my agency could not perform. Now default routing. Default routing is different. Default routing is, I don't know where to go. The 911 call has no idea where to go for whatever reason, okay? There, there are so many, there's so many reasons why a call doesn't know where to go. I, I, I can't even go into them all, but I am going to give you a couple of examples. So the, the thing that's important here is now look at, look at the definition. When you go back to the previous page, you'll, you'll feel my pain, right? They look so similar. And I was like, how do I understand the difference between the two? Because they do seem when you look at them differently. Default routing. The capability to route a 911 call to a designated default PSAP when the incoming 911 call cannot be selectively routed due to an any failure or other cause. Doesn't it sound similar? It can't get to the PSAP that it's supposed to because of a reason. But the key here is it can't be selectively routed. It doesn't know where to go. So the alternate happens after it's been selectively routed. The default is before it's selectively routed. I have no idea where to go. The first thing I thought of here was, do you remember the George character in the cartoons? And, and he's like, he's running. And then he's like, which way did he go? Which way did he go? That's, that's literally what came to my mind is the 911 call in a default routing situation has no idea where to go. Why does that happen? VoIP phone systems that are not provisioned correctly. 
wireless calls that are using Wi-Fi dialing or riding in on somebody else's network or they're not provisioned correctly. Um, folks are using things called fem to cells, small cells, Wi-Fi boosters. These things are all great to call Aunt Sophia McGillicuddy in California because you have bad service. But what a lot of folks don't realize is they wreak havoc on the 9-1 system. The other thing that we've learned is that sometimes calls will go wherever they want because somebody will take their device and they'll say, hey, lady in my phone, uh, call Rochester police. And then they'll be like, OK, calling Rochester police. Well, did you know that there's more than one Rochester? There's Rochester, New York, New Hampshire, Michigan. OK. Your phone location is here, but the phone that it's dialing here if you say, hey, lady, in my phone, call 911, there's so many variables, I, and I don't need to go through them all, but I want you to know the difference between alternate routing is after the selective router. The call knows where to go. And this is going to make sense when I tell you about my friends at Northern 911 in Canada. A, eh? Northern 911, and I say this every session I do when I talk about Northern 911, they are rock stars. It infuriates me when I will see folks giving them crap in social media study, uh, social media groups for dispatchers. They'd be like, what's up with Northern 91? I just got five calls from them. What the hell? Northern 91 is rock stars. You know why? Because they're picking up our mess. When that 911 call is traveling down the super highway to get to a PSAP and it does not know where to go. Okay. It doesn't know, should I go to this P and I'll give you, I'll give you an example. We had a call of multi-line phones. And if you watch the webinar that I did with Hank and Fletch a couple weeks ago, I, I give you an example. There was a woman working from home here in my town, but her company, the parent company was an hour away. When it was an hour away, her phone was not, her, her VoIP phone was not provisioned correctly. So when she picked up the phone, to, and dial the nine to get an outside line. And we know how I feel about that. She dialed the nine to get an outside line. And then she dialed the one because it was long distance. And then she was like, oh, what's the phone number? And then when she came back, she dialed one again and she dialed 911. But she realized it didn't go through. So she hangs up. But the call went to Northern 911 in Canada. Why? Because the call didn't know where to go. It was almost like the phone system was saying, all right, your alley information, the, the information in the computer system on the phone says you're in Braintree, which is like an hour away, but your physical location on the computer is saying you're in Rochester. So I'm really confused. So I don't know if I should send the call to uh, Rochester or should I send the call to, so I'm just going to go to Canada. And while many folks are like, that doesn't even make sense. It does make sense because what happens if our infrastructure is taken down? What if there is a major issue in a very large portion of our 911 system here in the United States? Having Northern 91 as a backup for us is amazing. So let's stop being mean to the folks at Northern 91 and maybe send them a gift basket and say, hey, thanks for handling all of my misfit 91 calls. Because that's really what Northern 91 is. They're the island of our misfit 91 calls. So if our calls go to Northern 911, it means that there was something wrong in the system. So it default routed. Alternate, Rochester is the star of the show. The call knows it has to go to Rochester. If it, get, if it is selectively routed to Rochester, but the busy sign is up, my phone lines, I'm getting inundated with calls for a motor vehicle accident and all my trunk lines are busied out. It's going to bounce to my alternate. Now the alternate is going to get to step up and be the star. The default routing is before selective routing. It just doesn't know where to go. So it goes to Canada. And while it doesn't make sense, it's, it's actually the right thing to do. How to access the emergency response data platform. Any public safety agency can access life-saving emergency data through the Rapid SOS Emergency Response Data Platform. There are two ways of doing so. 
Rapid SOS Portal is a powerful web-based tool that enables you to manage emergencies and access location and supplemental data for every call in your jurisdiction. Signing up for Rapid SOS Portal is easy and only takes a few minutes. In addition to emergency management tools and data, Rapid SOS Portal includes a training platform as well as administrative tools to manage user permissions, track usage, and analyze trends in your agency. To learn more and sign up for Rapid SOS Portal, please visit rapidsosportal.com. Rapid SOS also integrates with every major CAD, CPE, mapping, or other public safety softwares. With an integration, you can receive Rapid SOS data through your existing workflow, and you won't need any additional screens, tabs, or windows. To learn more about integrations, visit rapidsos.com slash public dash safety dash partners. So there is a part in our manual that talks about discrepancy reporting. And I know that many of you may have been on the webinar last week. Many of you have not. And folks that see this may not have, but I have to talk about it. One, for the study manual. And this is the best place to talk about it. Okay. So Hank, when I tested our new system in Marshall, Texas, it went directly to Northern I-1. That's a problem. And I don't have to tell you that the, you know, I, I don't have to explain to Hank Hunt that this is a problem. He knows it's a problem. So how do we fix that problem? If a call goes to Northern 911 or if it goes to, you know, Acme agency over here and it should have went to, you know, Rochester over here, whenever a call is not sent to the place that it's supposed to go, there has to be discrepancy reporting that takes place. Okay. Once folks fully understand discrepancy reporting and the importance of it, the more calls we're going to be able to fix. Because when we don't fix the call that is going somewhere where it shouldn't, it could potentially cost somebody their life. What I will tell you is that telecommunicators are really, really good at figuring out where the caller is and getting help there. But if we don't do anything to fix it, that's where the problem lies. So what I realized going through, and again, this discrepancy reporting piece is in the study manual at a later time, but I'm going over it now. And then I'm going to add a couple things for you because I think it's important. Discrepancy reporting has gone to the wayside. And I know this because I teach in nine one centers across the country. And in three of my classes, I talk about discrepancy reporting as it pertains to multi-line telephone systems as it pertains to misrouted 911 calls. And when I say misrouted 911 calls, I mean like wireless calls that if I'm standing on the line between Rochester and Marion and I place the call and it hits the Marion Tower, if I'm in Rochester and it hits the Marion Tower and it goes to Marion, that's supposed to happen. We want to get away from that type of routing, but that. That's legit. If, if we know that if I'm standing on the line and, and the closest tower for me to hit is in Marion, it's going to go to Marion and that's how it goes. But the red flag here is anytime you receive a call or your agency receives a call from another agency, Northern 911, from Marion, from Braintree, from Hoboken, New Jersey, from wherever if somebody says this is so-and-so transferring you a caller, it is your responsibility as a call taker, as a 911 center, as a telecommunicator, after that call is processed and help is on the way, that's a red flag for you to go, hey, why did that call go to New Bedford? Why did that call go to Marion? Why did that call go to Canada? No call should be going to Canada ever. So if the call goes to Canada or... You get a call. Here's another one that a lot of folks don't even realize. This is what they do. 911, where's location of your emergency? Hey, this is the Entrado call center with a transfer. Okay, what's the problem? Hi, I need an ambulance at 123 Main Street. My mom's having chest pain. Okay, ma'am, can you just confirm your address for verification in your phone number? And how old is your mom? Stand line. I'm going to dispatch and do EMD, blah, blah, blah. Dispatch the ambulance, hang up the call, and they do this. 
every single call that you get from the Entrado call center or from Northern, Northern 911 or from another agency that doesn't make sense, you need to be filling out a discrepancy form. And there's folks that are even within the sound of my voice, they're going to be like, what is a discrepancy form? I don't even know what it is. I'm going to show you a few that are on most 911 systems, but I'm going to share this resource with you because the study guide makes reference to it and it's important. There's a NINA technical standard document resolving any alley discrepancies and no records found, no record found. It is located here, nina.org slash page slash Annie underscore Allie, A-L-I underscore discrepancy. This explains it. The NRF is no record found. How many 911 calls do you have that say no record found? When you have a no record found, that means red flag. I got to do something about it. I got to tell somebody. Okay. Shanna, you are doing amazing, girl. What you're doing there, I can't wait to have you on the podcast to talk about what you guys are all doing, but just got off the phone with a hotel that opened in January of this year who's testing their MLTS. Their call went to National 91 Relay. Uh-uh, that's violating Carrie's law. You can't interfere with the delivery of a 911 call. If I call 911, it's supposed to be going to the PSAP. So if it's going somewhere else, it has to be fixed. And we do that through discrepancy forms. The purpose of this document is to standardize any alley troubles and no record found, reporting to facilitate their timely resolution. And any alley trouble is defined as a wrong Annie, no Annie, or alley discrepancy, which includes no record found. Wrong Annie includes 911 area code calls that actually have a phone number. That's another part of the section. We're gonna do that section later, but there are calls that are coming in that have a 911 area code on our systems through our networks that are actually working cell phones. They have a service plan, they have a data plan, and they are what I refer to as an NSI, non-service initialized imposter. It's pretending to be a disconnected cell phone, but it's not. And how do we know that it's not? Because we've used Rapid SOS portal, not integration, a portal to know that these happen more than we knew they happened. Again, we'll go over that later. The discrepancy reports. Here's what we have to look, we have to know, do we have them? I have a dear friend that I talked to this morning. I talked to him, I talked to him earlier a couple weeks, uh, a week and a half ago. I said, hey, send me a screenshot of your particular 911 system and where your discrepancy forms are. And he said, I don't have it. Today, he had it because he did a little research and figured out it was there. Damien, or is it a provider issue transferring across ladders? Yeah, it, it's so, it's so, there's so many different reasons. And in the section, when we talk about NSI phones, we will talk about the different scenarios. They're in the fourth report in order. It lists the whole reason why a call will come through the network with a 9-1 area code. But as far as the discrepancy reports go, I am shouting it from the rooftops. Why? Because all it's going to take is, is one time that a telecommunicator doesn't fix a problem, and the next time that call comes through, there is a problem, and, and that person can't speak, and it should have been resolved. So it is up to the telecommunicator to go back, if you don't know, and ask your manager, where, where are the discrepancy forms? What is it that I'm looking for? Who, what is it that I report? If you look here, this is an old written form. Let me clarify. I do not have these forms. A lot of folks will reach out to me and say, where do I get the forms? Can I provide the forms? No, this is just a picture of the form that we used to use back in the stone age when I was a baby dispatcher. Everything is through your CPEs, through your phone systems. It should be the simple click of a button that says, hey, this alley is wrong and this is what's wrong with it. 
either the incorrect name on a landline, incorrect community because it went somewhere else, misrouted call, appropriate misrouted call. If you need more information on what constitutes a true misrouted call, watch the webinar that I'm referring to, and I'll send you a link to that in the follow-up as well. Incorrect house number. And look there, no record found. And I'm going to share a screenshot with you, thanks to my friend Damien there, um, regarding no record founds. And then other, if it's wonky, and that's a technical term, if it's wonky, if something doesn't make sense, you don't just go, well, that was weird and leave it. You actually need to, to figure out why. Another example that we had, 911 area code call comes in. Came in, it was, it was, it was a 911 area code that came in on a landline and the address on the phase two on the alley was the house address and it should have been the tower address. So on the phase two, the address that's on the alley is supposed to be the tower, but it was the house address. So it's a 911 area code. It's a wireless device, but it comes in on a wireline and the address on the map and the address and the nothing. It didn't make sense. It did not make sense. So you file a discrepancy form. What we found out was he was using a cell booster. It never actually, it was a wireless device, but they were using a cell booster. Therefore, it turned it into a VoIP call, not a wireless call. And it was just wonky. So if it doesn't make sense, you got to fix it. And you have to document it. Document it, it through your system. Okay. What are the things that you need to be reporting? Wrong alley, 911 area codes, when you know for a fact it is a working cell phone. And again, can't go into it right now based on time, but we will go over that probably next week. Alley discrepancy, no Annie, no record found, misrouted calls, true ones. I just wanted to share because I'm not about having your attention on this and then just not sharing. This is not on your exam, but this is just a courtesy of, of Tracy because she wants you to know where the stuff is. Okay, here, if you use the Viper system, now these are systems, your system may look a little bit different, your screens may look a little bit different, okay? But on the Viper system, this Alley X, bad Alley. Next time you're in, you're on a Viper system, click that button after you have a 9-1 call and a form's gonna come up and it's gonna tell you what you need to do. If you don't know where that sheet goes, ask a manager, ask an admin person, if there's no policy or procedure in place, please reach out to me and I will point you in the right direction to get this ball rolling. We are not fixing enough 911 calls. We should be having a lot more of them fixed. Um, Joe, a bunch of towers with the wrong address. We've had that in our agency too. Start throwing around. Uh, it's going to be on your hide if it doesn't get fixed. Call work screen down the bottom here. Alley discrepancy form. Zetron Max up here on the... Um, in the on the top, if this information is incorrect, you can fix it through there. It goes to the admin on your Vesta over here in correct location. There's a lot of folks that have not been trained on this. This is a priority. We have to get this fixed. Our folks at Baldwin County, um, this is on the Vesta system. So when you hit uh, incorrect location, they they gave us this sheet right here, um, this screenshot. This is what comes up. So as soon as I hit incorrect location, it's going to give me, it's going to backfill in all the information that's there and it's going to allow me to check, check it out. Okay. Insufficient address, blah, 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 blah. Incorrect location information. This one. So this is an example. This right here, these are things that are falling through the cracks. This is extra information I think is important. Don't worry, there's plenty of time for all the right information. This is extra information. These are the little things that folks are overlooking. This building right here, this had the incorrect name. So this was the 911 call that came in and the place I can't read it. I forget what the actual name is. Um, it's too small there, but right here where it says pool, that's the name of the, the facility. This is like a condo complex or like a you know hotel or with a pool or whatever. That pool up here on the top, that's supposed to be the name of, say it's Sunsetter. So that's an incorrect name. That needs to have a discrepancy form and somebody needs to fix that. 
The other thing that we look at is, is as far as an address goes, we should be spelling out things like west and east and north and south to prevent anything from falling through the cracks. And then under the comments, okay, you can add things. Sometimes if there's an inconvenient location, and I use uh, Snippet to it Road, uh, there are folks that are in our jurisdiction, they lived at 120 Snippet to it Road, but the address, their address is 120 Snippet to it Road, but based on where their driveway goes to get to their house, the driveway is between 70 and 80. So 70 Snippet to it is here, 80 Snippet to it is here, and the address for 120 is right in between those. Doesn't make sense. So put something in there, okay? So some of these issues may not actually be the issue of the alley, but rather parsing issue with the CPE. Yeah, bottom line, if it's not right, we gotta fix it. And that's what discrepancy forms will do, okay? So now back to the terminology that we need to be knowing. And I, I think you all will know well enough, if you really wanna dig into this, please reach out to me. My contact information is at the end. I'm very passionate about this stuff because it's going to cost somebody their life and I don't want that to happen. So some more of the terms that we need to know for the exam is Annie resend and rebid. Um, Annie is retransmitted or rebid. If initial Annie is garbled to get the proper alley to come back, you need to hit a rebid. The phone system may have a re rebid button. Some of them do it automatically you should know if i ask you do you have to manually rebid or is it automatic you should be able to tell me because it's important to know the other thing is is most 911 systems your cpes your customer premise equipment will only respond back every 30 seconds I can't even tell you how many times I've seen folks clicking the button. That's what I'm doing right now. Click, 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 click. If you continue to click it every five seconds or so, you, you, can, you can just think about that as a morphine drip. Like you can click it all the times that you want. You, you are not going to get anything. Every 30 seconds is when you get an updated alley dump back. So have you ever tried to happy click, 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 click on something and you jam up your system? Just be careful, be cautioned with that. And that's why I'm a, a huge advocate for the Rapid SOS portal because the Rapid SOS portal will update locations every three to five seconds-ish. So there's a big difference there. Doesn't matter if you're integrated with Rapid SOS, your system is only gonna go back and ask for something every 30 seconds or so, unless they change it otherwise. Call transfer. Call transfer is the capability to redirect a call to another party. Router to router transfer. There are two different 911 system selective routers that have transfer codes to each other. So if, if there is a call that goes to the wrong place, it'll get recognized at one router and it needs to be sent to another router. So if one of them gets a phone call that's not native to their selective router, it actually has codes for other selective routers to say, hey, this isn't my, this isn't my mess. This isn't my flaming bag of you know what. It's it's somebody else's. So sometimes the system has to router to router transfer that call. Okay. So it will send the other. Um, it'll send the call to the other selective router, which will in turn send it to uh, the, the actual PSAP that it belongs to. Geospatial routing, like this should be happening everywhere these days, especially with the ability to utilize device-based location, right? So geospatial routing. We are going to talk about ECRF, emergency call routing function. When we talk more about the next gen 91 solutions, I have a cool little diagram for that as well, because there's a lot of abbreviations, but I tell a little story and you'll remember it. Hopefully you remember it. Um, and then GIS, graphical information systems. Geospatial routing uses this information to actually route the emergency call to the appropriate PSAP 
or emergency service provider based on the civic location or geographical coordinates that are provided with the call. Here in Massachusetts, I don't know how many other statewide agencies or PSAPs are doing it today, but I know that the state of Massachusetts 911 department, we were one of the first statewide entities to use geospatial routing. And it's it's super cool to see it. You know, it's it's cutting down on on misrouted calls because it's actually routing the call based on the location of the person versus the tower that that it hit. So I definitely know folks are seeing better location with calls. Uh, just a reminder, it is three o'clock. If you do have to jump off, by all means, jump off. I have an hour and a half set for the study group each week. Some days it'll be an hour, you'll get out of class early. Some days we'll go a little bit later, but I have the window because I know that there were occasions in the last session where I had to go over a little bit. So I just wanted you to be able to block off the appropriate amount of time. So I'm not sure how long we will be, but if you gotta go, it's recorded and you'll get that copy. Policy-based routing. We will get more into policy-based routing um, in a, a few more sessions, but it's a technique that follows and routes data packets based on policies or uh, filters. If this, then that. If this, then that. Because we're going to get into gateways and and you know going from legacy to ng ng back to legacy like so if i'm on an ng system and i got to transfer that call to you and you're not like it's going to be there's going to be policies that are are in place so that's policy based routing uh button transfer aka speed dial in the last session i didn't have this i do this time because somebody told me that it was on there it's also called fixed transfer. I never in a million years would have known that a button transfer speed dial is also called a fixed transfer. So when I went back into it, I will, I, I realized in the 6.1 study guide, there, there's a definition of button transfer and it's also called fixed transfer. So there you go. I just noticed Max, you posted, I fax over about 10 forms a month. From our Vesta system, the biggest problem is getting comments that describe what the issue is. Right. And, and that's a, that's just a matter of, of chain, uh, telling them what the problem, like, you got to tell me what the problem is. If you just look at it, you might not know, but, you know, it's all about training your folks. This is what I want you to do. And this is what I need you to do. So I'm glad you shared that. Thank you. There are folks, believe it or not, there are directors that have said, I have never received one. I had somebody say that to me a couple of weeks ago. I've never received a discrepancy form. I almost fell off my damn chair. I'm like, what? Like, how long have you been in the position? Oh, 20 years, never received one. Well, got to fix that, okay? Call tr conferencing, AKA three-way calling, the capability to bridge a third party onto an existing call, also called conference transfer. 911 direct trunking. This implies that the 911 call routes through the originating service central office directly to the PSAP and not through a selective router, okay? So the call goes from, say, the person's house right to the central office, right to the PSAP. There is no need for the selective router to take place. It's just what it says, 911 direct trunking. No selective router is needed. So we're going to talk about different types of public safety answering points, PSAPs, as I mentioned in the first uh, study group session, Nina and FCC are still using the term PSAP, public safety answering point. Um, some folks are using ECC, but nonetheless, when we refer to the PSAP, it is the place where the 911 calls are being answered, whether it's a primary or a secondary, as you can see here. But the way that the systems are set up is your primary PSAP. So once it goes to the central station or the selective router to the central station and such and such, the first stop that that call is delivered to where somebody picks up and says 911, that's your primary PSAP. If for whatever reason between the central office and that selective router, it cannot get to the primary PSAP, 
it will be sent to the alternate. And over here between the phone and the central office, if it has no idea where to go, it's default routing to who knows where. And then the primary piece app, if, if say they don't dispatch for police or fire or EMS, they're going to send it on over to the secondary piece app. Your primary piece app, piece app, which 911 calls are routed directly from the 911 control office, central office. Okay. Secondary piece app, piece app, which 911 calls are transferred from the primary and then alternate pre designed, pre designated piece app to temporarily receive 911 calls when the primary piece app is unable to do so. Piece app types public safety dispatch point, PSDP. The ability to receive the call, but does not have any access to Annie and Alley data. Okay, so time to upgrade. <laughs> there are ways to get that information. A lot of agencies just settle for not having the information. There are ways to be able to get that information. And I hope that your folks are, I, I, I know there are some out there. And then a legacy piece app is a piece app that cannot process I3 defined interfaces. It still requires camera trunks or ISDN trunk technology to deliver the calls. There are still a lot of legacy piece apps out there. If you have not moved to next generation 911, then you are considered a legacy piece app. A single agency versus multiple agency, okay? Single agency, an agency that dispatches for only one discipline in one jurisdiction. Multi-agency, handling dispatch for multiple services. Police, fire, EMS, animal control, highway department, and or multi-jurisdictions. Usually a combination of cities and counties. In such cases, the ECC or PSAP is typically an independent agency whose communication, uh, whose board is comprised of the agencies that they serve. A consolidated or regionalized. Okay, so we look at Charleston County Consolidated 911 Center. It's a facility where multiple public safety agencies choose to operate as a single entity. Here in Massachusetts, they've been working for several years to regionalize their 911 centers, to consolidate, to put, to put more agencies in, in one place. There's good and bad things about that. There's people that feel really strongly about it, but just know that consolidated, consolidated and regionalized are similar. Then there's co-located. Co-located involves separate agencies or agency divisions sharing a comm center facility that within the structure's interior, a separate area is provided by a wall or a pod, each having their own staff, CAD protocols. So an example is Cincinnati uh, PD and fire. They're in the same room. The fire's over here and police is over here. They are co-located in the same dispatch facility, okay? Um, I'm not sure where uh, the county of San Luis Obispo is in the process of designing and construction a new co-located co uh, co dispatch facility, but this was something that I, I had found when I was searching to, to come up with an example. Um, but basically they're taking, they, maybe you have a sheriff's department and a city police department. They're in the same building, sharing the same equipment. Uh, they're just dispatching for two, two entities. A virtual piece app. So these are the folks, uh, we had Arlington and Alexandria, Virginia, at the time that COVID was taking place that set up virtual 911 call taking. How cool is this? These folks are at home and they're taking calls. That's a whole nother story, but I'm gonna show you where you can read and hear about it. So virtual PSAPs, um, an operational model directly enabled through NG911 features and or network hosted PSAP equipment in which telecommunicators are geographically dispersed rather than working from the same physical location. I know uh, my girl Keely in Mountain Valley in New Jersey, when I was there teaching a couple of months ago, back in uh, the end of April, she was setting up her to-go boxes 
where they had their phone systems and they were in boxes and she was setting them up and getting them all ready to make sure that they were working properly, just in case. So there's a lot that's happening with these virtual peace apps. This was an article that I wrote when I was with Rapid SOS. So if you were to just Google 911, where is the location of your dispatchers? You can read this article. We highlight uh, what Arlington and Alexandria, Virginia did during the beginning stages of COVID, where they stepped up very quickly and they made accommodations to be able to help isolate their folks uh, so they didn't send cooties through their entire center. So there's your features, types, features, types of peace apps, types of uh, 911 systems. Anybody have any questions? If you do, put them in the chat or reach out to me via email, which is located here. Please like and follow my social media. Sign up for um, my newsletter on the website there. And up in the right-hand corner is my podcast on Scene First with Tracy Eldridge. I have lots of great conversations with public safety difference makers who are saving lives on both sides of the call. If you have a, a story that you want to share, please reach out to me via my website on the podcast page. You can sign up to be a uh, guest on the podcast. And then in the lower right-hand corner is the On Scene First Safe Team Net group. I've had to rely on that group a lot over the last couple of months. I've been struggling with my own mental health uh, through some stuff that I've, I've been dealing with. Uh, but that's a safe place for first responders to go when they need just a little bit more support to get through the day. So until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay strong, and stay here. We need you. Thank you.